So since we are in Slovenia, and since this conference deals with the problems of the master and largely with psychoanalysis, I will start with an anecdote that links Freud and Slovenia in a rather spectacular way, and which can serve as a sort of parable, maybe the best entry point into our subject. Um, both Slavo and I have used this anecdote before. Many of you may know it. Still, I cannot resist telling it again briefly, for it is the most apt uh, for the present occasion. Namely, Freud was our compatriot. Uh, he spent most of his life as the citizen of Austria-Hungary, which included the present-day Slovenia, and he traveled through Slovenia a number of times on the way to Italy, but on one memorable occasion he stopped for his one and only attested visit to this country. This was in the beginning of April 1898. He spent his Easter holidays on a trip to the Adriatic with his brother Alexander, and on the way back they visited some subterranean caves in Karst in Slovenia. And Freud reports about this trip in a letter to Fleece. Uh, dated April the 14th, 1898. And I will leave aside Freud's remarkably hilarious encounter with a Slovene, his only documented encounter with a Slovene, and focus just on his visit to the spectacular Škocian caves, which are, were a major tourist attraction already then and much bigger now. It's part of the world UNESCO heritage. So Freud says, the caves of Škocian are a horrifying freak of nature a subterranean river running through magnificent woods with waterfalls and stalactites in pitch darkness and a slippery path guarded by the iron railings. It was Tartarus itself. If Dante saw anything like this, he needed no great effort of the imagination for his inferno." End of quote. So this tourist trip suddenly turns into something like a metaphysical journey, a descent into an abyss to visit Tartarus, the heron, the, 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 Dantean Inferno, and uh, well, Dante allegedly traveled through this area, and there are some uh, dozen or two dozen caves which claim that this is the very spot where Dante got inspiration for Inferno. Um, and um, the time of this visit was the period of gestation of the interpretation of dreams, and if it's a bit far-fetched that Dante would get his idea of Inferno there, it's perhaps less far-fetched that Freud possibly got his inspiration for the motto of the interpretation of dreams on that occasion. The motto that inaugurated psychoanalysis taken from Virgil from Dante's Guide in Inferno. Flictere sine quo superosa horonta movebo. If I cannot bend the higher powers, I will move the infernal regions. So this is the motto which presides over psychoanalysis. And I will nevertheless... Um, well, remind, this is a footnote, point out that this was not the first motto that, uh, that Freud chose. The one he chose was from Milton's Paradise Lost, which runs like this. Let us consult what reinforcement we may gain from hope. If not, what resolution from despair? So I should keep, up, keep in mind this alternative, alternative motto. I think it's, it's very beautiful. So what did Freud find at the bottom of this Slovenian inferno? And uh, the account of Fries continues like this. The ruler of Vienna, Herr Dr. Karl Wege, was with us in the cave, which then after three hours spewed us out into the light again. And this uh, innocuous line contains actually a big drama. At the bottom of the abyss, Freud met Herr von Wien, the master of Vienna, as he says, the burgomaster of Vienna, who was one of the best known and most notorious political figures at the time in that part of the world, and their common descent into the Slovene hell was their only meeting. They would never come face to face in Vienna. They had to come to this Andra Schauplatz, to this Slovene other scene. Uh, the guys, side guys had to take a vacation for this uh, encounter to be possible. So who, who was this person? Why is this encounter so emblematic? Dr. Karl Weger was the burgmaster of Vienna for 13 years, uh, the head of the Christian Social Party, a very popular and populist leader, and most not notorious for his blaring anti-Semitism. The best clue to his significance is to be found in Hitler's Mein Kampf, where Hitler, who spent his youthful years roaming the streets of Vienna, 
The same Vienna that produced all these grand intellectual and artistic figures, the notorious cunning of reason was playing some tricks there. And he praised, he, he praises uh, the greatest German burgomaster of all times, the real genius of the burgomaster, the great engineer reformer, in particular the great promoter of anti-Semitism. So Weger was the one that for Hitler opened his eyes as to the nature of Jewry, and he praised his ability to stir up the feeling of the masses and address them beyond the treacherous parliamentary politicians and parties. And it is from Weger, he says, that he learned everything he needed to know about the anti-Semitic propaganda. So there is this drastic sequel, this is retrospective knowledge, but already at the time, Lueger's anti-Semitism was so notorious that uh, the first time he got elected in 1895, the Emperor Franz Josef refused to appoint him. The Emperor actually refused to appoint Lueger three more times, but had to eventually give in to the democratic will of the people, and after the intercession of the Pope, actually. So why did the Emperor so adamantly refuse this nomination? No doubt he had his conservative reasons. He wanted Vienna to be ruled by decent aristocrats, not an upstart, not a troublemaker, hate monger, who catered for divisions and zealots. So the emperor instinctively opposed this kind of politics that abandoned all decency, manners, and decorum, or what Hegel brought together under the heading of Zittlichkeit, and contravened against the unwritten laws which formed the fabric of society and built its success on these contraventions. So there is something emblematic in this constellation. Franz Josef was arguably the last emperor, the last figure of the ruler as the father, the father of the nation, the epitome of stability. He ruled for 67 years, surpassed in length only by Louis XIV and Elizabeth II. And Freud was born under his rule and spent three quarters of his life under his rule. So, in this dispute about investiture, so to speak, the last model of the old authority confronted virtually the first model of the new type of authority, quite literally the figure that we serve as a direct model of the catastrophic rise of the new type of authority. So the emperor did what he could to stop this ascent, a historic moment that one can see as the swan song of the old authority. Furthermore, it's significant that Lviga was qualified as populist already at the time. Uh, so it seems that the term populism first emerged in uh, the rise of the People's Party in the US, uh, quite positive connotations, but there was the, 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 the flip side was very quick to emerge. And uh, so he was called populist at, at the time. It is as if the advent of populism as a political concept and political logic reaches directly from those times into ours. And at the same time, it strangely frames the fate of psychoanalysis. So Freud's encounter in, with Lviga in, in Slovenia underground has, as I said, the value of a parable. And in a dramatic echo of this encounter, Freud will have to flee Vienna in 1938 and finish his days in, in exile, once that Lviga's pupil will recapture Lueger's Vienna, almost exactly 40 years to the day after Freud met his master in the Slovene cave. And this can serve as an inaugural image of psychoanalysis and its political mission, confronting the problem of authority after the downfall of all old authorities in the historical moment of the rise of new type of ersatz, fake masters, a mission which directly translates and reaches into the present turmoil. And I, just as an aside, uh, if you, the, this story has uh, immediate um, repercussions, uh, the ghost of uh, Lueger still haunts Vienna. If you know the geography of Vienna, you know Ring, the big road that encircles the center, part of the ring was actually called Dr. Karl Lueger Ring. And, and, and this was the part of the ring where, where university had its address. Until 2012, so until very recently. Um, what's in the name? Yeah. But there is still a Dr. Karl Weger statue to be found in Vienna, also very centrally, next to the Stubenring. 
and it was allegedly contextualized by a plaque placed in 2016. But the monument continues to be frequently covered by graffiti, and increasingly so in 2020 and 21. And there is a petition for it to be removed. So you can see this brief iconic encounter in 98, this still haunts the present geography of, of Vienna. And how is this possible? It is possible because many historians, including Jewish ones, um, consider that Weger was actually a great modernizer, that he did a lot of good for the city. And it seems that no Jews actually suffered much under his administration. So that his anti-Semitism could allegedly be seen more as a pose and sort of rhetoric to obtain votes. Um, and when confronted with the reproach that he had many Jewish friends, he invented the proverbial line, in this town, I determine who is a Jew. So, but even so, I mean, the, the, one is surprised by this sort of belittling or like making this as a sort of case of benevolent, benign anti-Semite as opposed to the fanatical one. But the latter, well, clearly emerged from the former. And this is this logic of extenuation, this lenience that made a certain type of discourse publicly acceptable. The logic that still very much holds in our postmodern times is deeply symptomatic. They're gradually making acceptable something that was unimaginable, like a decade ago. And you know that Hannah Arendt uh, made a big case for, in her totalitarianism book, that there was a new kind of anti-Semitism emerging at that precise moment, which no longer relied on the traditional patterns of religion and money. So here's my first point. There is a widespread criticism of psychoanalysis going around, conspicuously by Deleuze, Gattari, uh, Foucault, large part of feminism, that it presents the father as the clue to every authority, even though diluted and sublated into the mere signifier of the name of the father. Yet, still a father, thus perpetuating the patriarchal tradition, and in larger scope, that it reduces the vagaries of human desire into a family drama, to Oedipus even though this is the most dysfunctional family in human history. And as opposed to this, I would argue that Freud discerned the function of the father and his vicissitudes precisely at the time when this traditional account has historically lost its sway, at the point of the decline of traditional sovereignty. It's not about extolling and preserving the father, but about taking stock of the father's function after its demise, as the afterlife of authority not its reduction to a pre-modern age. And of course, to be sure, Freud proposed the story of the murder of the father in the, um, um, in the horde and the dead father acquiring more power than the living and um, the, the symbolic authority underpinning the authority of the symbolic. But one could say, and I'm repeating a line that uh, I used several times, but I still find very useful, which is sort of one-liner, that what happened with the advent of modernity is that the dead father himself died. And the dead father lost the sway, the symbolic, the symbolic authority, the symbolic, the symbolic sway. This is why we have these uh, um, problems of the fake authorities which emerge on, on the place, in the place of this, uh, of this demise. And Lacan, with his uh, neck for slogans, proposed an excellent slogan, which works very well in French, which is père au pire, father or worse. And father was bad enough, but we are heading for worse. <laughs> Don't you think that getting rid of paternal authority, patriarchy, etc., will will liberate us? So. Um, and here is my second point, which is just a continuation of this, to say that uh, this is the return of the repressed, the recurrence of the master that should have met his demise with modernity, a master not realizing that he was dead. All this is misleading because um, this is not a regression to a constellation where sovereignty still rules supreme, um, as if the old master figures could make the comeback with a vengeance. This is the fundamental enigma one is confronted with, this is the subject of our conference, that the new figures of masters 
They put on a charade or a travesty of sovereignty, but they are inherently the products of modernity, or the products of what Lacan called the university discourse. And Lacan's theory of uh, the four discourses was proposed like 50, 52 years ago in what now seems to be another world. In the immediate aftermath of May 68, in the historical moment which seemed to promise a possibility of radical change, it was the most elaborate, complex, and sophisticated theory of power, domination, authority the psychoanalysis ever proposed. A standard that still obliges. But what to make of it? How to abide by it half a century later, in a historic moment of closure? That was a historic moment of big opening when Lacan was proposing this theory. And we, as it were, live in a moment of closure where also all possibilities seem exhausted, worn out, and, and drained. So the theory of the four discourses was premised on the break of modernity. It was only from the vantage point of that break that one could envisage the discourse of the master as the clue, the underlying structure of the pre-modern social ties, bringing them to a minimal common core with a structural function of the master signifier, what Lacan called the signifiant maître, or S1, in the position of the agent. And as opposed to this, what uh, inaugurated modernity was his proposal of the university discourse, which spelled out the major claims of modernity, placing the knowledge S2 in his algebra, and I don't want at all to go into any technicalities, in the guiding position, proposing a general framework that would accommodate the unprecedented rise of science and technology, and at the same time, the political form, a social tie, based on the legitimation by competence, knowledge, expertise, a collective rationality that will prevail if allowed and unrestricted public use. If you want a contemporary version of this um, university discourse and what it stands for, think of uh, Stephen Pinker's bestseller, Enlightenment Now, the case for reason, science, humanism, and progress. I think it's a wonderful case of, uh, this is uh, the model of uh, university discourse at this point. And this is from like 2018. Um, the, critical, the critical point of this dispositive was that it doesn't entail, of the university discourse, that it doesn't entail that the master has vanished. In the kind of scheme, it is now rather pushed under the bar out of sight, hidden, at the place of the concealed truth of the discourse of knowledge. Its suppression, conditioning, the very advent of the universality of knowledge, lying low, waiting to make a coming out, but not as a return of the past, rather as a future prospect, and one could say, master or worse, like maître ou pire. It is a travesty that makes it worse. Something that now appears as a fake, as a counterfeit master, the master it is double, but the double in psychoanalysis is never a mere copy. It possesses an eerie quality that exceeds the alleged original, a surplus. And think of the long history of the doubles which proliferated precisely at the break of modernity. Now I prepared a lengthy digression excursion into Kant and Hegel. I will leave this out. <laughs> if, if there is interest, I can... Uh, um, summarize somehow uh, what, what I had to say. And I will just, uh, they're, they're the two towering figures pertaining to this, precisely to this modern break, the break between the discourse of the master and the discourse of university. And uh, they were both very well aware, extremely well aware of the stakes of this problem, that they actually found themselves on the verge in slightly different uh, ways, but they made proposals how to counteract this. And I will just briefly make a, a, a very brief digression on Marx. And Peter actually already mentioned this yesterday in his presentation. Namely, the first one who had to confront this new constellation, the quasi-return of the quasi-master, was actually Marx in his 18th Brimaire. And he gave us, already with the opening salvo, in the first line, the simple canonical formula that can serve as a sort of general gu guideline. First as tragedy, then as farce. And this sums up somehow the return of the, of the master. Instead of Napoleon, the pitiful figure of his nephew, a caricature verse of scorn and derision. But the problem is that this figure cannot be cast aside as an oddity or an accident. It must be treated as a symptom, 
and to remember that Lacan hailed Marx, not Freud, as the inventor of the symptom. It is a symptom of the then ascending liberalism, and liberalism as a political concept, as a political movement, was established precisely at the very same time, at the same time as Bonapartism, which then again feels like it's double in disguise. And this is not the return of the master, but a farce, and the farce is the way in which the new bourgeois order could survive, consolidate, and flourish. It was under the auspices of the farce and caricature that the expansion of industrialization and modernization in France could occur, while mixed with blunder and arbitrary caprice. And technically, there is a connection between this fake master and the lumpen proletariat, the outcasts of all social classes, and this is what Marx basically points, points out. So the figure of this Louis Bonaparte may seem to be as far removed as possible from, well, the university discourse, discourse of enlightenment, discourse of reason, knowledge, science, expertise, but it is the farce of it that brings out its presuppositions and functions as an extension. It is no coincidence, therefore, that Bonapartism later served as the model for analysis of fascism and continues to be sporadically evoked today as a tool for understanding the new populisms. And although the problem is structurally the same, in a nutshell, one should not make haste. First, because the figure of the philosophical master has drastically evolved, and particularly with the rise of the media and then social media, which has added a staggering dimension to it, then, because the nature of the capitalist global spread and its antagonism um, uh, is of a different order of magnitude and quality. And third, and maybe uh, most importantly, the nature of repression has taken a different form, where everything seemed to be publicly displayed in full view. Transgression of the written and unwritten laws is manifest while this coincides not with lifting, or lifting of repression, but with heightening of repression, with repression that is the degree to which the repression itself is being repressed. And uh, for my present purpose, I stop there with Marx. It suffices to point out that Marx was the first to confront this structural problem in one of his most brilliant political texts. And as is true of all subsequent quasi-regressions, Bonapartism came precisely as a response to a failed revolution, to a failed revolution of 1848, with so many failed revolutions to follow. So the first occurrence of what would become a rule, the rule of the unruly, the recurrence of excess over the rule. Now, Fred's encounter with Vega, now I'm pursuing a very different line, now for something completely different, okay? Um, in case we, we don't forget this. Um, so Freud's encounter with Lviga roughly coincides with a, some completely different kind of phenomenon, with an artistic production in another part of Europe, namely with Alfred Jarry's Ibu Roi, the king, Ibu, Ibu the king, produced in December 1896 in Paris, and I quote from our Wiki Oracle, the production's single public performance baffled and offended audiences with its unruliness and obscenity. Okay, uh, this is even the Wikipedia knowledge, and indeed this seems to be the literal staging of our problem, the force of sovereignty subtly detected by this young man of 23, by Jury, subtle precisely in its utter lack of any subtlety giving us the full display of an undiluted spectacle of arrogance, stupidity, shamelessness, egotism, greed, cruelty, vulgarity, debauchery. Um, I don't know, as a footnote, like Ubu, Trump, hmm, what, what's in a name? <laughs> this, they sound like onomatopoetical <laughs> expressions, but onomatopoetical expressions, they... Um, imitates some natural sounds, but what is this the imitation of? You know, it, it creates some sort of specter it's imitating. The evocative nature of the signifier, I don't know. With them, there's a strange question. 
And, uh, well, I can add that the same Alfred Jarry also proposed a new discipline that he called pataphysics. And if metaphysics deals with the rule and the universal, then the domain of pataphysics is the exception, the unruly, the glitch, and the abnormal. And I'm mentioning this because uh, uh, Michel Foucault, in his lectures at the Collège de France in 1975, which are precisely entitled The Abnormal, briefly touched upon this problem under the label of grotesque sovereignty and proposed Ubu as a model. And I quote now from Foucault, I'm calling grotesque the fact that by virtue of their status, a discourse or an individual can have effects of power that their intrinsic qualities should disqualify them from having. That grotesque, or if you prefer, the, the ubuesque, the ubuesque, is not just a term of abuse or an insulting epithet, ubuesque, terror, grotesque sovereignty, or is talking in terms of the maximization of effects of power on the basis of the disqualification of the one who produces them. I do not think this is an accident or mechanical failure in the history of power. I do not think that explicitly showing power to be abject, despicable, ubuesque, or simply ridiculous is a way of limiting its effects and of magically dethroning the person to whom one gives the crown. Rather, it seems to, to me to be a way of giving a striking form of expression to the unavoidability, the inevitability of power, which can function in its full rigor and the extreme point of its rationality, even when it hands in the hands of someone who is effectively discredited. Sorry for this long quote, but I think it's a very telling quote. Like It's like Foucault in 75, describing the developments which will occur 30 years later in some very precise ways, at least, in this, at least the phenomenology of it. And uh, for Foucault, the grotesque sovereignty is the inherent and constant possibility of all sovereignty. A sovereignty brought to its pure form, a manifestation of the fact that all sovereignty is based on the grotesque, on the theatrical, ultimately groundless. The grotesque reveals its ex nihilo, the pure and crude display and performance of power as such. The grotesque sovereign, in his obtuseness and obscenity, displays the nature of power as such. And Foucault uses the terms the clown and the buffoon. Every, so every sovereign is ultimately a nubu in disguise. But when disguise is taken away, this paradoxically reinforces his position, doesn't disqualify him. Even if this grotesque nature is brought to light for all to see, even if deliberately displayed, this has no consequences. And I was speaking about the theory of the four discourses, and Foucault, indeed, on this one passage, proposes a fifth one, namely Ubu's discourse, the discours du but, the discours du but, as a term. And yes, you know, the Lacan technically famously also proposed the fifth one, the, the discourse, the capitalist discourse, but just once, and I rather think it was a Hapax Legomena, that he didn't, he didn't pursue this idea. But here we have, well, capitalism, Ubu, like Adam Smith, avec Ubu. <laughs> maybe this is, the, this is uh, in the balance. So this is a lucid and maybe unexpected insight, but I think that there are two problems with it. First, for Foucault, the grotesque appears as the naked and raw truth of the sovereign power manifesting itself and always potentially present, occasionally coming out. But is there, can there be a bare truth of power, power fully exposed, undiluted, deployed in its sheer inevitability? And this is the paradox I hinted at before. I mean, the more everything is exposed, the bigger the deception. The more all inhibitions are lifted, the bigger the repression. And ultimately, I think no power without this obfuscation, no naked truth of power since nudity can function as the ultimate disguise. Yuval has written a very beautiful text on that. And second, Foucault, so keen on historicity and the historical breaks, analyzing them with subtlety and meticulous precision, is here acting in a surprisingly ahistorical manner. The grotesque is presented as a transhistorical category, stretching from Nero, and for him this is the first major case of grotesque, 
sovereignly, the debauchery of uh, Roman emperors, via Shakespeare's tyrants to Mussolini. So the grotesque, um, the, these are all the, uh, these all serve as, uh, indiscriminately serve as examples for the sovereign power it, um, taken both from the traditional sovereign power and from the, the, the biopolitical one. But our problem is uh, more precise, is the way in which the university discourse inherently produces these figures of grotesque sovereignty as symptoms of its internal tension, when S2 cannot measure up to the place of the agent, the knowledge. And the British discourse, with all its crass ignorance, is an offspring of the university discourse of knowledge. But tellingly, Foucault points to another problem, namely that not only the sovereign or the fake sovereign, but also the rule of bureaucracy can display the grotesque as well. Bureaucracy is the monstrous extension and expansion of S2, of this knowledge, knowledge run amok. Uh, it's not only the grotesque monster, but the apparatus which should run the modern state that can go berserk. And this was Hegel's wager, reduce the master to the minimal in order for the administration with his know-how to be able to run the state rationally. But the moment that the master is removed, knowledge itself runs wild. Knowledge may not quite be the epi epitome of rationality purported by the Enlightenment, and this is another and final quote from Foucault. Since the 19th century, an essential feature of big Western bureaucracies has been that the administrative machine, with its unavoidable effects of power, works by using the mediocre, useless, imbecilic, superficial, ridiculous, worn out, poor, and powerless functionary. The administrative grotesque has not been merely that kind of a visionary perception of an administration that we find in Bazak, in Dostoevsky, or Kafka. The administrative grotesque is a real possibility for the bureaucracy. Ubu, ubu, the pen pusher. I love this. <laughs> ubu, the pen pusher, not the, no, not the master. It's a functional component of modern administration. So here we have it. Given the Lacan's uh, structural determination of S1, the master signifying S2 as the chain of knowledge, we have the master and his double, the coming out of the master in the grotesque sovereignty, and the S2 and its double, knowledge run amok. In, it's the redoubling that will get us in the end, the travesty. First Ubu as the sovereign, then Ubu as the administrator, the public servant, the pen pusher, Ubu as the grotesque version of both S1 and S2. So there is a double which arises from what seems to be purely a signifying logic, the S1 and S2. Uh, it's like a phantom double that this logic gives, gives rise to. Um, after the master and his double, I'm coming to my final part, and knowledge in its double, let's consider the third of structural elements that form the building blocks of the theory of four discourses, which would be jouissance and its double. Jouissance, enjoyment, is what comes in surplus, as a surplus, and arguably all jouissance is surplus jouissance. It is implied by, produced by the signifying logic, yet heterogeneous to it, seemingly a surplus over it. It was one of Lacan's great feats to connect the question of surplus enjoyment to the problem of Marx's surplus value. And this is the entry point into his theory of capitalism. In one of the most uh, important pronouncements in the seminar on the Four Discourses, he maintained that what defined capitalism, the invention of a new economic order, was that at some point, and initially somewhere in the 16th century, I quote, something changed in the master discourse at a certain point in history, surplus jouissance, the British rear, became calculable, could be counted and totalized, comptabilisé is the French word. This is where what is called the accumulation of capital begins. So this statement is quite staggering, for it encompasses uh, the advent of capitalism, Marx's theory of surplus value, and Lacan's take on the concomitant surplus resistance, all in one go. Um, but 
here we have a, a, a far-reaching proposal. Capitalism is obviously about the production and accumulation of surplus value. This is its maximum definition. And I can't coin the psychoanalytic notion of plus de jouir, surplus enjoyment, which has all the ambiguity in French, on the model of Marx. Now, if the surplus value can be counted, calculated, accumulated, turned into profit, this has a parallel, a parallel homology, says Lacan, in surplus resource. The economy extends to the economy of resource, or the economy of resource subtends economy. The surplus resource also becomes calculable. The contention is perplexing and paradoxical because the very definition of resource is that it always comes in excess, that it derails that it cannot be contained in the domain of, say, the pleasure principle. That is the non-economical by its nature. That it's um, always out of place and out of joint. Transgressive, traumatic, repetitive. So how can it be counted? How can one com contabilize? And if we are to follow this suggestion, then capitalism succeeded in an incredible feat to tame the untamable beast. To submit it to counting and measure, to count the uncountable, to measure the immeasurable, to economize the non-economical, to bring the excess to the boundaries of the pleasure principle. But this is not quite the taming that would go in one direction. This also has the reverse effect, and this is really important, namely that capitalism was never to be contained within the pleasure principle, it was always beyond, and never relied on hedonism, despite the appearances in consumerist society. It was inherently driven by excess, making resources countable also turned count into something excessive. Always driven by surplus, always irrational, unlimited. It infinitized the count. If resources could be put into service of economic accumulation, which seemed to contradict its nature, then it, it also, as if contaminated, the economic realm as such, into which it was inscribed. Its success could be capitalized, but then the capital itself became permanently driven by this excess. Enjoyment is as if homogenized through the subsumption in accumulation, but this is what derails the homogenization itself. Here then would be the great achievement of capitalism. What should derail as an excess is internalized as the inner condition. Any crisis becomes the generator of further drive. Any radical or even revolutionary innovation can begin to serve as the fresh blood of this drive. Hence the futile expectations of the last century and a half that some final crisis would now occur or we have found out some really radical thing which would oppose this circle of, 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 uh, of capitalism. And um, the subject subversive gestures, and uh, capitalism actually loves revolutions. It accepts them into its bosom and stri um, thrives on them. Now look at May 68. Now, jouissance is double. Does it mean we have two kinds of jouissance? Jouissance that can be functionalized and jouissance that cannot be. The one serving the capitalist economy, the other one in excess of it. Or is it rather that this apparent split is itself already inscribed into the accumulation driven by surplus resource, so that everything that resists it is already part and parcel of its drivenness? Is this the secret of this capitalist success and the, impossibility, the impossible task of stepping out of the circle? And here is how Lacan himself points out very precisely. What, uh, quote, what Marx denounces in surplus value is the spoliation of resource, the theft of enjoyment. And yet, this surplus value is a memorial to surplus resource, its equivalent of surplus resource in consumer society, suddenly starts speaking about consumer society, derives its meaning from the fact that what makes it the element described as human is made the homogeneous equivalent of whatever surplus resource is produced by our industry. An imitation surplus resource in a work. Moreover, that can catch on. One can do a semblance of surplus resource. It draws quite a crowd. So here we have 
jouissance and is double, the imitation of jouissance, and I can use the expression en plus de jouir en toc, which uh, means probably imitation, and the dictionary also gives être du toc, to be fake, and also sham. So, in another of the really most important pronouncements, we have it in our letters, the imitation of jouissance, a fake jouissance, a semblance of jouissance, briefly, jouissance and its double. But this doesn't mean that there is some authentic, lost jouissance of which uh, this is the mere imitation, uh, the consumer is fake. This is a mirage that is sold to us, and this is why the unmasking doesn't, uh, doesn't do the job. So does this logic have a limit? Is there a way of getting out of it? Hmm. I'm afraid it does, and I'm afraid there is. But not quite the way we would wish for, but rather something that may be happening now, something that perhaps characterizes our present moment. And I would say, can one think of an excess over the excess itself? The side product of this integration of the excess into the profit-making machinery. Perhaps something shifted in the 50 years that separated us from those times. The period marked by the steep rise of neoliberalism and perhaps a process is underway that will gradually or even suddenly make this infinite capacity for integration impossible. Something happened to this surplus jouissance and its accumulation. Maybe a surplus of a surplus is being generated, the surplus redoubled in a quite different sense, as a byproduct which can no longer be integrated and threatens to shatter or paralyze the thrust. It is as if crises and excesses no longer function in such a way that they can be made into the motor of accumulation but rather threatened with collapse, the disintegration of the social bond. And the COVID crisis, crisis of the last part of a couple of years has exacerbated, crystallized this, uh, magnified, it has a magnifying glass. Lacan had in mind the economy of the symptom and enjoyment in so-called consumer society, but now it seems that the subject of the new transformation of capitalism is no longer the consumer, but rather the subject as, as waste. The subject as waste. And, okay, I will, I will just in the end give a, maybe an empirical observation of this. Um, of this affective surplus that is manifested in two seemingly opposite reactions. On the one hand, the endless fatigue, and on the other hand, the accumulated rage. So, fatigue, tiredness, exhaustion, burnout, depression, and I will point out that tiredness is a different thing than exhaustion. I mean, if you're tired, you can get a rest and then you can't do, realize all the possibilities because you're too tired. But exhaustion means that all the possibilities have been exhausted. Huh? However much you rest, you, the possibility is already exhausted. So, um, um, there is, um, and th this is not a widespread psychological condi condition but a socially necessary effect, not an individual shortcoming. So there is an extension, exacerbation, and generalization of depression which has reached pandemic global proportions in the last 30 or 40 years. Well before the COVID, it actually much more widespread than COVID. And whose spectacular rise coincides and intersects fatally with the rise of neoliberalism as its counterpart. So these are not uh, individual afflictions where everyone is to be blamed for their own depression, just as everyone is to be blamed for their own failures in the race of competition. It is a necessary social form of effect. And on the other hand, there is an excess of rage, anger, wrath, fury, seeking an outlet. There's like a free-floating excess that cannot be quite recuperated and channeled back into the, the, the circle. And is directed Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, okay. Um, I'll, I'll <laughs> I condense this. Okay. So, there is this uh, affective surplus, and it has two forms, the, the seemingly opposed, like the active one and the passive one. And I think they are just two coins of the same, the, the two sides of the same coin. The depression can be seen as a rage that was arrested and stuck in the throat, turned inward 
so that it immobilizes, paralyzes, and blocks. So the oscillation between the two is structural. And this duality seems to define the present COVID time in particular. So this syndrome of depression rage also directly concerns the fate in, of psychoanalysis in the last half century. There is this massive pathology which seems to exceed the traditional classical trinity of neurosis, psychosis, perversion, and also its tra recent transformations and extensions of pathological narcissism, the borderline universalized foreclosure Slava was talking about yesterday. So it's not that um, these are some new um, entities, but rather there's a quantity of them that, uh, the, of the accumulated social effect that goes far beyond the boundaries of psychoanalysis as a clinical practice. And one of the reasons that psychoanalysis has been marginalized in recent decades was the stunning rise of the pharmacological, pharmacological industry, which offers a wide range of chemical means for these massive and acute afflictions. While psychoanalysis is expensive, time-consuming, and socially limited. So the world has been flooded with antidepressants and anesthetics in one form or another. Maybe the zero form of subjectivity is the anesthetized and, on the other hand, stimulated subject. So these are a bit naive uh, empirical observations, this excess over the excess, but it's directly related to our theme, namely to the theme of the new type of masters, since it's precisely the rise of populism that has so far been able to use it, canalize it, exploit it, and this is the stuff that fuels it. If the pharmaco industry serves pacification, Populism is built on excitation. It systematically encourages the production of rage. And the targets are easily interchangeable, and there is a glaring absence of a political program, but it handles, it addresses this excess over the excess, which cannot find its political representation and thus fuels anti-politics. And uh, liberal politics has to increasingly confront this um, and um, okay and uh, it, this anti-politics which has uh, started to call the shots and define the ground and um, I will just end with this um, having moved away from Lacan and the university discourse well not really Lacan practically never undertook the risky business of predicting the future except, perhaps astonishingly, with his prediction of the rise of new racism and increasing segregation. In uh, 1967, I quote, our future of common markets will be counterbalanced by the increasingly crude expansion of the process of segregation. And on the same page, uh, he related this to the consequences of the way that science rearranges social groupings and in particular, the universalization it introduces. And he returned to that in that famous interview in 73 and several other times. So this was before there was ever talk of the four discourses, but uh, there is this uh, university discourse as the agent of implementation of science, universalization, common markets, globalization, but the more this process progresses, the more the tension will intensify, the more the problem of surplus enjoyment will increase, the bigger the danger of, of segregation, the bigger the, the, the whole rhetoric of the theft of enjoyment. And well, um, uh, let me just, uh, I don't know, end on a gloomy note. <laughs> uh, maybe gloominess is the beginning of a uh, the difference, there is uh, the other things to be considered. I have to finish. Sorry, I'm cutting this short. And one of the big things to be considered is the advent of social media. And this is another element that would have to be carefully scrutinized and deserve another paper. But I will just finish with this formula. The, there is more communication than there has ever been in human history. There's more 
information that has ever been in human history. But the more information is available, the less there is knowledge. And the more communication is universalized, the more this process threatens with the falling apart of the social tie. So this exacerbates precisely this, uh, this idea I've been trying to present of the excess over the excess that cannot be, cannot be recuperated. So, what is badly needed is the politics of new kind of S1 and the left that would cease to be a mere reaction to all these processes and would present its own agenda and have some trust in it. Thank you. Uh, Mladen, thank you very much. Um, I apologize for being, uh, you know, a terrible menacing presence over there. Mm -hmm. So we Sorry. don't really have time for questions, but since Mladen is one of my favorite people in the whole world, I will allow a couple of questions to be posed, uh, but we will collect them and Mladen will respond to them at the end. So we'll just collect a few questions. Think of your question, you know, make it matter. Um, at the end. Eric. Uh, at the end when? Um, no. After the questions are collected, I'll uh -huh. give the word okay. to you. Um, Milan, I was just thinking of connecting your talk with some of Slavoj's remarks and wondering if maybe the, um, the complement of ubu um, as grotesque sovereignty is uber, as, as the kind of, uh, as the, the structuration of work that produces both fatigue and rage. So, Eric, you're, you're the master, master of punning. Uh, I thank know, you. And I don't know anyone else who would come <laughs> up with Jamila puns has the next question. And, and all the puns uh, sort of uh, being not the, just the word games and funny, but doing the real conceptual work. And I think from Ubu to Uber, yes. Okay, Jamila. Excellent. Yes, it, it, it's a question, it's a clarification, but, but maybe there's also an objection. I'm wondering, in the last part of your talk, you were mentioning these two excesses, exhaustion and rage as, if I understood it correctly, has two sort of limits. You call them excesses, but I'm wondering if you're considering them as two possible limits to the unlimitedness of capitalism. Capitalism is, is reaching a point where it's touching or facing, confronting those two phenomena that represent sort of limits that cannot overcome. I'm wondering if this is, like, you're calling them excesses, but you're frame it as limits, uh, framing them as limits. And the other thing is that, are those really then limits? Are those really the sort of walls that capitalism is hitting uh, and then could be potentially disruptive? Because when, we, when you talk about exhaustion with all the sort of affective fragility that comes with it, and when you talk about rage with all the possibility of manipulating rage, I'm wondering to what extent those two excesses or limits uh, really, uh, you know, um, are vehiculating potentiality for, for, for change and subversion or for blocking and dismantling capitalism. Thank you very Does much, Jamila. We will collect one more question. Um, Aaron? Could you just say a bit more about the jouissance on talk? Uh, I'm really interested in this notion, the imitation jouissance. Of course, the argument is, if there is imitation jouissance, that doesn't mean that there's an authentic jouissance, but why not? I mean, could you just explain mm. a bit more if everything is an imitation jouissance, then what's the use of the term imitation as a critical? Hmm. All right, thank you very much. Mladen, you have uh, the final word. Oh, there's one more? Okay, why not? Let's, let's have one more. Uh, two more. Uh, no, sorry. Please, the, yeah, okay, sorry, four more. Oh, dear <laughs> Lord. Um, I, talked, I talked for too long. Please I, I keep forget, them really uh, short and to the point. I will try to. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. Um, my question would be, like all these uh, notions of like the master, the populism, the authority, bureaucracy, they are very much phenomenon that are quite territorial, I would say. They are quite Territorial. What? Yeah, territorial. Yes. And on the other hand, like how we produce the world and how we live in it and, you know, all the excesses. Uh, is not really. So it's produced like material doesn't circle around the world the way we think within a certain country, for example. It's not territorial, it's like international or global. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if we could think of the master or are we thinking of the master uh, more in terms of like a 
that works like a placeholder, you know, something that is linked to the old authority as such, as you were describing, you know, the, the emperor. And is that, uh, Donna uh, Haraway uses this term of like placeholder, that is something that we, uh, we know the world is changing, but then the circumstances change and we don't adapt. So we use these old, you know, fractions of the world until something new happens. So I'm just wondering if we have this idea of the master in our heads that's very territorial at the same time the world is changing so much that we can't adapt this authority so much. Thank you I very like much for, no, no, sorry. thank you very much. Just, thank, you. thank you, Francis. I would like to know what the logic is behind uh, Lacan's connection of surplus jouissance and segregation. We can talk about this later, but how do you get, why does this condition that you've described of this mm. excess upon excess lead to segregation? Yeah. All right, and I'll give uh, the final question. I'm sorry, Yuval, but I'll give the final question to Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Gregor. Uh, Martin, real quick, um, just, I might be literalizing the idea of excess over excess, but I was thinking of the financial crash of 2008, which was an example of excess over excess with the selling and exchanging of mortgage-backed securities, which are excess value put on top of excessive value. So, and what that did, that excess over excess produced a crash, and if there was not an intervention, it would be over. So is that a viable excess over excess to literalize it in financial yes, terms? Sure, sure. Yeah. That is one of the examples where it came to the edge, as it were. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, I'm just afraid that there will be more of this. I mean, the, no, not a revolution, but a crush. Yes, that's, 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 that's uh, Yes, I, I don't know. I mean, each of these questions, I'm, I'm seriously, I'm sorry I took so long, will be behind the schedule. Uh, um, what can I say quickly? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, um, okay, Aaron, uh, the, the, um, what I can't call jouissance and talk, he in the same sentence connected to consumer society, uh, which uh, is sort of the redoubled jouissance, and maybe there is a supposition that once there was some authentic uh, jouissance in the pre modern societies, but now this jouissance on talk has taken over. And they are actually selling us the very prospect or possibility of the authentic jouissance, which is part of the jouissance on talk, as it were. I think this is the logic of what uh, Lacan tries to develop there. And uh, it's only one place. It's only one place he speaks about the consumer society and the double, the imitation, Im imitation of jouissance. I somehow think it goes far, but I don't know if... Uh, I mean, anything one says goes way beyond what is implied in the... Um, Jamila, um, I don't know, I mean, is, this, is this the limit, is it in excess? Um, I, I myself don't know. I, I was trying to describe a certain development in the last 50 years. We live in a world which is extremely different from the world in which Lacan proposed the theory this, for these courses. And this is an excellent theory, very, very elegant. Everything holds together, everything can be deduced. And uh, um, I was trying to say that what happened since is not that this theory was invalidated, but that actually something that I can't, couldn't see or we couldn't be seen at the time, namely the redoubling, the redoubling of S1, the redoubling of S2, the redoubling of jouissance, the double of the master. And this redoubling will get us. This is the problem. Um, is the double is much worse than the S1 and S2. And it takes over the, the, those things. And so, yes, what, what I was uh, getting at in the end is the question of whether we are heading for a certain development which will bring a halt or a, a crash of, of the whole thing. The, 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 this uh, accumulation of rage and accumulation of depression will actually explode in some way. You know, there will be a serious uh, tear, tear in, in the social tie. You know, there will be no longer a common social tie. This is falling apart, I think. 
and precisely falling apart through under the guise of the generalized communication. Everybody can communicate with everyone. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm a bit confused. To your question, the question of territoriality, and is master territorial? Is populism territorial? Well, yes. Uh, but is master territorial? I think uh, the effects of the master are, are global. Yeah, and somehow it has, the, it has the global repercussions. Um, when Trump was uh, elected in America with a very territorial, make America great again or whatever, the absence of agenda which uh, is uh, encapsulated in this one slogan, it, it, had, it had terrible global repercussions about the ways that the discourse can be formulated or uh, what can be publicly said or not. What is the, 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 the very measure between the decent and indecent between the um, between knowledge and, and, and opinion, huh? between uh, facts and rumors. I think that this, between private and public, I think that all those, uh, all those oppositions which define so much of the, our development after the Enlightenment actually are getting increasingly collapsed. And uh, I think the, the public space and politics depends very much on maintaining those oppositions. And um, so the, yeah, I don't know, territorial, I mean, a master, a territorial master, a territorial populism, nevertheless, in the globalized world, has global repercussions. I mean, it defines the, it curves the discursive, discursive space. Um, what else? Sorry, there were like five questions. I, I missed them. <laughs> We can repress the questions and the debate, that's fine. We'll Maybe. repress it and then we'll have the return of the repressed after the pause. So thank you, Madan, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions.